Well, welcome, y'all. Uh, if you're uh, viewing online, tuning in, thanks for uh, doing that. And uh, some of you all around the world, I guess, tune in, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Brewster, welcome. Good to have you with us. Uh, we we're talking about the men's barbecue earlier, um, and all chaos happened here because when Kayla said on the reel, I think that you guys experienced that. The men of Chelan were challenging the men of Brewster. Uh, I thought that was so cute because Chelan hasn't beaten Brewster in anything. So go ahead and cheer there uh, for a long, long time. So anyway, looking forward to seeing you Brewster men uh, this Saturday. Uh, listen, we're starting a, a new series. And every time we start a new series, um, sometimes people leave the, the first one like, uh, what? He didn't say anything. I'm just trying to set up. The whole series, all right? So I think there's something here, but I'm going to do a little bit of an overview. But eventually, we're, going to, we're just going to talk about the stuff that you're afraid of, the stuff that stresses you out, the stuff that um, brings anxiety or that you keep hidden or that affects you and nobody knows, all that stuff. Uh, as maybe many of you know, because I've shared it before, man, when I was little, um, I didn't dig the dark at all. Um, I was afraid of the dark. And um, I blame my dad mostly because we lived, um, we lived over here on Wapato in the church parsonage of the Baptist church. Not nearly as nice as it sounds. And for some reason, our bedrooms were upstairs, my brother and I. And you had to turn the light off upstairs and then make your way down the stairs. It feels like there was no light switch at the bottom of the stairs. So I would turn the light up at the top of the stairs, and I would just jump every step I could because I knew the monster, whatever was up there, was right behind me. Uh, don't get me started about being put to bed at night when I was younger and no nightlight, all right? When there's no nightlight, you can see everything, right? You can see images and shadows and then given an older brother that would hide underneath my bed and reach up in the middle, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I, listen, I, I still to this day, I, I had an incident at elk camp a few, uh, sounds like I'm really manly, I just go to elk camp, hang out with my buddies, I never shoot anything ever, um, but I woke up in the middle of the night, and little Luke Laughlin, who used to be a little kid in my youth group, I'm like, he's like, what's going on, I said, I don't know, I, I, I'm freaking out, because I couldn't see anything. And he was like a third-year psychology student at Whitworth or something like that. Do you have palpitations as you're, as you're breathing? I'm like, just calm down. I'm just scared, all right? Uh, but I was freaking out because I couldn't see. It was dark. Um, that's happened to me a couple times. I, I don't dig that. Uh, when I was a kid, I think the way my parents handled it was stop your crying and get to bed. Or there's no monster. That's your brother, all right? Uh, Nowadays, you can do this. Did you know you can buy genuine monster spray? Yeah. This is the, not getting political, this is the soft society of kids we're raising, all right? <laughs> that you can spray, especially bubble gum. Did you know that monsters hate the smell of bubble gum? Because they think they're going to get bubble gum in their fur, and they hate that. So if you spray this underneath the bed, some of you kids going to college, you may want to take this with you, okay? You, you spray this underneath the bed, and it's going to for the monsters are going to disappear. All right? First of all, who's making money off of that? You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, but it's another way to, don't you wish you could do that in your adult life? That you had something that was bugging you, kept you up at night, you're scared of, um, you were sad over, you were angry over. And you just take this issue spray, and you just spray it, and like everything's fine. Because when you're a kid, what do you do to avoid the monster underneath your bed? A couple of things. You leap into your bed. You got to jump over because they can. They can you, you step over. You got to jump into your bed. Or we thought maybe just me that if you tuck in your sheets really tight. That's the monster's kryptonite. That they can't get you if you tuck in the, the, the sheets really great. Even though they can rip your head off, they can't get through your sheets, all right? Uh, so we try, we, we try all this stuff. As adults, what do we try? I mean, we got stuff that's in our mind that maybe we don't even 
talk about, but at night it keeps us up. Um, to call it torment may be a little strong, but it doesn't stop. We're sleepless, we're panicked, we're worried. Uh, and he, he, here's the difficult part. Again, maybe it's just me, or maybe it's just the people I hang out with. Is we keep that hidden from everybody. That's just our own little secret. That when we go to bed at night, we're the ones that just, with our eyes wide open and just like, what am I going to do about this? What if someone finds out about this? When is this ever going to stop? So we can try to cover up past wounds or anxiety or shame or guilt or regret. We can try to tuck our adult sheets around us like getting involved with poor relationships that distract us or using some kind of substance that makes us forget about it or numbs it or we just spend a lot in order to distract us. We tried to achieve, 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 and I think if we can just get more and more and achieve more and more, then all this stuff that we're afraid of or we're stressed out about will go away. I've been at this a long time. I know I don't have to convince you of any of this, that all of us got something. And like I say, almost once a month, if you don't have something, hold on, because it's coming. Something's around the corner to be upset about, hurt about, angry about, scared about, worried about. So I just want to spend a little bit of time uh, with, with this uh, Under the Bed series. And when I, tonight, today, I just want to talk about uh, the monster underneath your bed. And whatever that is for you, because it's completely different. I, I'm going to list some stuff, but I don't know what your monster is. I know what my monsters are. I know the things that cause me worry and keep me up and, 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 and fill me with regret. And you have a memory of it, and it just kind of ushers over you again. So let's start with, I'm just going to ask you two questions. First question is, how do you know it's a monster? Like, how do you know it's a monster and not just a, you're just having a bad day? Right? You just, uh, that was a bad day. I feel sad today. Or it's just been a bad week, so that's why I'm so stressed out. Or it's been a bad month. That's why I regret some of my decisions. It's really been a bad year. And how, how, do you, how do you know? How do you know it's a monster that, that comes at you? I'll, I'll give you two ways. Monsters in our life that just compared to just having a bad day, the monsters are relentless in their persistence. It just keeps coming, just keeps coming, just keeps coming. And it's usually in your thoughts. And then, then it's in your thoughts. And then it's in your thoughts. A little history lesson. When I was a kid, we had these things called records. Um, now, I, I used to talk about this and like say to all the high school, middle schoolers, college kids, kids, records are vinyl. But they're making a comeback, right? Um, Taylor Swift has her stuff out on vinyl, so it must be cool. Um, but records, you know, they, they press, I don't know how they do it, they press the sound or the talking into a vinyl piece of plastic or vinyl, and, and then, whoops, it works. I don't know how, it's magic or, or lasers, I don't know how it works, right? But we had these, when we were little, we had these storybook, uh, this would be a, a 45, or, or maybe you have a bigger one with a longer story on it. And you would have this record player that would go with it, I don't know that we had one. Our rich friends did. I don't know if we had one, but it looked like this. And you would play this record on the record player and read along with the book. It was like an early podcast, all right, or early audible. So you can read along with the book as the person on the record reads along. You, you with me? So it would be, um, I, I'm not sure what we were allowed to have. Um, it was we we're too young to have focus on the family, so we probably only listened to, to uh, Gaither Trio albums or something like that. We weren't allowed to listen to books, and certainly not Disney, the, um, the Evil Empire. But you would listen to it, and, and it would read along, and then you would have to know when to turn the page. Because in the 70s, the uh, grade school kids were really stupid, all right? So you'd read along, and it would say, ding, turn the page. Oh. And then the, record, the, the person would keep reading the story. Does anyone have any recollection besides me that we did this? Yeah, yeah, all right. 
And then, then you'd read along with it and say, ding, turn the page. Like you can't figure out when to turn the page on your own, all right? But ding, turn the page. Here's the problem. Some of the monsters in our life, past regrets, anxiety, worry, hurt, loss, it's like it doesn't stop. It's like if you ever had a record, and especially kids, you throw them around and everything, and, and, uh, uh, and they get scratched up and everything. That you could get a record and you're reading the story and it says, ding, turn the page. And it's stuck. Ding, turn the page. And like, I turned the page. Ding, turn the page. And just stuck. It doesn't move. It's stuck. It got some, ding, turn the page. And you're like, wait, I'm already, there's no more pages. Ding, turn the page. And you're like, I can't. That's the same thing with the monsters under our bed. The monsters in your head. It's like sometimes it just keeps coming. It's like, ding, turn the page. It just, you can't, you want to stop thinking about it. You can't stop thinking about it. The Apostle Paul, who's a big deal in the New Testament, as big a leader as we have in Christianity, he was with you. He said, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide to do bad. I said not to do bad, and then I do it anyway. He says, my decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time it happens so regularly that is predictable. Ding. Turn the page. Listen, we're not just talking about breaking the rules. We're not just talking about sin. We're talking about the stuff that is relentless and persistent that keeps coming after you, keeps coming after you, keeps coming after you. What's the name of the record that you are stuck on? It just keeps hitting you over and over and over. Anxiety, fear, worry, depression, regret, emptiness. Listen, if you've been come to real life for a while or tuning in or, or join us in Brewster, or even if this is your first time, you need to understand we are not a type of church that just says, read this verse, pray, and it will all go away. We think some of our issues are much deeper than that and need a lot more help and intervention than that. So if you leave here today and said, hey, Kyle, just acted like you, you, you just trust more and believe more and everything's going to be okay, that ain't true. Hold on. Here's another way to know that it's a monster, not just a bad day. That monsters are relentless in their pervasiveness. That's not just surface level. It's so deep. It affects you down deep where you are, where your soul is, and then it ripples out to people you care about and you wish it didn't. If you've been going to church for a long time, whatever, you're like, I wish I could be more biblical. I want to live biblically. Let me show you some biblical. Let me show you some great, great leaders from the Bible. Moses. Moses was, come on, you've seen the movie, right? Let my people go. Here's the Ten Commandments. Who's with me? Let's, ah, uh, here's the, the, the river. Kill those people. All right? Moses says this. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. He's talking to God. If I found favor in your eyes, then do not let me face my own ruin. Well, that's a monster. This is, this is way down the road. Like, he's accomplished great things, he and God. And he reaches a point that says, yeah, I'm done. Kill me. Joshua took over from Moses. He was handpicked to be one of the greatest military commanders in the history of Israel. Handpicked by God. Joshua says this. God, why did you insist on bringing this people across the Jordan to make us victims of the Amorites, to wipe us out? Why didn't we just settle down on the east side of the Jordan? This is too much. I don't want any part of this. Elijah, probably one of the greatest prophets of all time. In fact, Elijah was such a great prophet in the Old Testament that when Jesus came around in the New Testament, they thought, hey, wait a minute, maybe Elijah's back. Elijah was a big deal. He, made, he accomplished a ton. Look at this. He has this Big, huge encounter with these horrible people and prophets of Baal and so thing. And he de de just destroys them, like almost single-handedly. 
And then get some people in there to, to finish the job. And then one woman, one Jezebel says, you're dead. And big tough prophet Elijah says this. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and he prayed, this is his prayer, that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. I'm a loser just like everybody else. Job, we love Job. Job's in the New Testament. Job's like the most patient person ever. And that's why I was raised like Job is patient. Job is a patient person. Have you read Job? It was a horrible life. Horrible. And I think I would agree when Job says, obliterate me the day I was born, God. Blank out the night I was conceived. Let it be a black hole in space. May God above forget it ever happened. Erase me from the books. Man, that is a monster. Because he is done. It is too much. David was the greatest king in the history of Israel. Made some mistakes, but cruise along. In fact, I don't know about you, but being raised in the church and everything, man, when I'm having a bad day, when I'm having a bad week, a bad month, I had right to psalm. I want to read something from David because it's so real and raw, right? Here's David. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish. In my years, years by groaning. Come on. You want to be biblical? Have you ever felt like any of those guys? You're in. You could be God's leader. You could be part of the pages of Scripture. Because the fact is, everyone in life, somewhere along the way, from Moses to today, is going to run into stuff that's going to take them under, that they don't want to talk about, that stays underneath their bed and is persistent and pervasive and keeps coming at you. And most of us over time, in church or out of church, thinks there's no solution. I'm stuck. Ding. Turn the page. The next few weeks we're going to talk about this, but to get unstuck, first thing, somewhere along the line, you've got to name the monster. Even if you don't want to name it out loud, you better name it to yourself at least. And I, ain't, I ain't scolding you. I'm like saying, listen, there's some hope here. And not just name the monster, then you need to admit where you are. Like, this is my monster, and this is how it's affecting me. Man, there's great power in doing that. When you say that out loud, when you say, this is the thing, this is how it's affecting me, man, you are on your way. Let me give you just a little bit of, uh, of, of, of Jesus' intervention here, and then we'll be done. But let me tell you about Jesus and the monsters, all right? Jesus said, hey, if you want to see God, the Father, if you want to see what God, the Old Testament God is like, the God, the Creator, if you want to see God, just look at me, Jesus said. So sometimes we think that God is distant, doesn't care, that we're struggling on this thing on our own, and this monster's under our bed, and God's up there like, ah, deal with it. But Jesus says that he cares about us and cares about our situation. And if Jesus cares about it, God cares about it, that Jesus the Son says God the Father's just like him, so let's see what Jesus said. When Jesus was on earth, he offended all the religious leaders all the time. They were the one keeping all the rules, controlling the temple, all that stuff. And they were constantly upset because he hung out with people who were less than, who struggled, who couldn't measure up to the religious system. They couldn't figure out why a person that was supposed to be religious like Jesus would hang out with such low-life people. So one day on hearing this, Matthew tells us, one of the low-lifes he hung out with, on hearing this, Jesus said, hey, Pharisees, rulers, religious rule keepers. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. It's a two-sentence story with three characters in it. Right? College kids, can you figure out the characters? Whitworth kids, I'll help you. 
Um, that was funny. There's a doctor. There's sick people. And there's healthy people. Which one are you? You're like, I'm the doctor. Well, that makes you Jesus. Because Jesus is the doctor, right? Are you the sick people or the healthy people? See, the sick people are the ones that knew they had a problem, that knew there was something under their bed, that knew they couldn't conquer it and deal with it by themselves. And they were looking for some way to do it because the religious rule keeping wasn't working. The healthy were the ones that had stuff under their bed and wouldn't admit it or wouldn't even realize it and thought they had that, hey, I can do this all by myself. Watch this. Watch what I can do. Listen, who's in trouble here? It's the healthy people. The healthy people are in deep trouble because they're trying to step out on their own effort. And there's a doctor, God Almighty, Jesus the Son, right in front of them, offering help. Listen, I'm not trying to offend anybody across the country in Brewster or Chalene. But the arrogance of the healthy is going to pull them under. Your attempt to appear like all is great, your attempt to avoid vulnerability because you want everyone else around you to think you don't have any problems and you're not struggling, is going to pull you under. Matthew says that Jesus went from town and villages, through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom in healing every disease and sickness. Let me give you just three quick things. Really quick. We'll come back to them later in later weeks, okay? But right here, we see that Jesus wants to be your teacher. He went through all the towns, and one thing he did was teaching. Jesus knew how to live. He was the master of the art of living. He's not a magical fix. But I would encourage you, if you're struggling with something, if your, your record is stuck, that pause and stop and say, okay, I wonder what Jesus would say. I wonder what Jesus does. I wonder what Jesus teaches. Because he has something for you. Matthew says that Jesus has good news. That his message was good news. Lately, there's not a lot of good news. And this is a scolding. So buckle up your seatbelt. As followers of Jesus, when you speak... When you text, when you post, are you good news or are you bad news? Well, I'm just telling the truth. You're doing it in a bad news way. If the monsters under your bed are affecting you as a believer in Jesus Christ and what comes out of your mouth is bad news, boy, I would step back a little bit. End of scolding. The other thing Jesus wants to do is heal you. Not in a name it, claim it, come to my crusade and pay me money and I'll knock you over healing. It's not that at all. It's much more than that. Jesus cares about where you're at. Matthew tells us that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Have you ever felt like that? Listen, there's a lot of factors. Let me answer one more big question. We're almost done. Where do the monsters come from? And we'll come back to this. Listen, just so you know, not a psychiatrist, not a psychologist, not a counselor, just a dude with a microphone that thinks he knows everything, all right? Do not, I'm not, listen, I don't... A lot of stuff I don't know about. In fact, I've had conversations and I, people I really trust in those fields. But I'm not an expert. But really quickly, the stuff that's under your bed, that monster, that thing that keeps turning the page, that keeps attacking, that you can't get rid of, that it keeps you up at night. There's some factors, right? There's some biological factors. Like depression is linked to like some chemical imbalances. 
You, I mean, it may be just naturally that you're that way. Maybe your, your family's been that way. Maybe that comes through. That, and God's process for that is to get some help. If you break your arm, you go up to Dr. Snyder, she'll set your arm and put it in a cast. If your brain hurts, if your emotions hurt, if your heart is broken, you need to get a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a counselor. And within Christianity, that, there used to be shame in that. There isn't that anymore. There's no stigma against that. If you need some help, please get some help. We can encourage you. We can offer you names of people as well. But there's some biological factors. There's also psychology, psychological factors, Right? You got stuff from their past, traumatic experiences, emotional factors. Like you've been through things, you've got stresses, you have wounds. It's like if you take a look at a tree, the cross section of a tree, people, forest majors, whatever they call them, forest, for tree people, uh, <laughs> they can look at the, they cut a tree and they look at it and like, hey, I can tell all about. I can tell if there was a forest fire. I can tell how much water. Have to tell, uh, 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 tell everything about it. If you were to cut a cross section of your soul, we would see lots of stuff. And I don't care if you're a church person or not a church person. A lot of times you think that was in the past. I don't need to deal with it. But as you've heard me say many times. Stuff from your past, trauma, disappointments, hurt, monsters. We think if we avoid them and put them in the past and keep moving ahead and we leave them behind, that they're gone. But they go into the basement of your soul and they start pumping iron they start working out. And they don't get weaker and they don't disappear. They get stronger. And then they're coming out at a time where you can't control that. That's why we need to get some help. Here's how to move to a dark, monster-filled room to light. Jesus offers a lifelong transformation. He's not looking at just helping you through your bad day, although he's available daily. But he's looking at the long game, right? If our life is Wreck-It Ralph, anybody, anybody seen that movie? I think there's two of them. Uh, has anyone seen it? Right. Wreck-It Ralph. If you haven't seen it, Dad, Ralph wrecks stuff. That's why they call it Wreck-It Ralph. All right? He just goes around wrecking stuff. And he, uh, not intentionally sometimes. He just can't control himself or that's just the way he is. But who helps Wreck-It Ralph? Anybody? Fix yeah, Fix-It Felix Jr., Fix it, Felix has this golden hammer, and he can go and put things back to place. We want God to be Fix it, Felix. Like, God, I'm struggling with this. Please hit me with your hammer. And it goes away. Listen, sometimes we go through stuff and we say a prayer and it disappears. Like, I know some of you, you used to be a smoker, you gave your life to Jesus, and never, you never smoked again. You know what we call that? A miracle. You know what a miracle is? A once in a lifetime happening that rarely happens. The rest of us have to join the 12-step program in order to stop smoking. All right? We want that. Bam. Give me my miracle right now. And God's saying, let's work on your life transformation. More than this moment, let's dig down deep and have it affect uh, you and the rest of your life and the people around you. No quick fix. Not only does Jesus offer this lifelong transformation, he offers salvation. That's a churchy word, so don't get lost in that. We use that a lot, um, like, hey, are you saved? Are you born again? And, and I'm not putting those things down. And salvation is usually like we say, we've got this sin problem, and it separates us from God, and we need to be saved from the debt of our sin. That's true. When the angel announced to Joseph, Mary's not yet husband, that she was pregnant, he says, hey, listen, Joe, Mary's going to give birth. She'll give birth to a son, and you're going to give him the name Jesus because he will save 
his people from their sin. That word saved means healed and to be whole. It's not just about taking care of your broken sin debt. It's about taking care of your broken heart as well. Now, sometimes we think, we say a prayer in middle school, we ask Jesus into our heart, then we're good to go. Then the rest of us, we just try harder, try harder, try harder. My thing to you is that was never the intention of Jesus. Jesus knows that sin gets in our way of relationship with him. But it's so much more than forgiveness of sin. He's not saying try harder, try harder, try harder. He's saying trust more, trust more, trust more. Which means to relax and trust. So what do we do now? i got three next steps for you. In a series like this, I don't want to be trite. Um, I can't cover everything. I can't explain everything. I do know that there's times where it seems so simple to a complicated problem. Well, maybe it is simple. Maybe the steps are simple, although the decision is super difficult. Let me give you three steps. They're in the blue cards that uh, Brewster has and you guys have. We, We hand them to you in your handout when you came in. They're online. You can get them on the app. But we'd like to have the steps on the blue card so you can listen and then do something with what you heard. All right? So pick one of these. First one. Step out into the light and name your monster. Not on Facebook. If Matt Smith has a dance routine on TikTok he can do to show his monster, okay, go get him, Matt. Name it to yourself. If you need to write it down, if you're a journaler, if you have one good, trusted friend, name it to them. You don't have to name it. Because when I just said that, it just freaked a lot of us out. Because we don't want to name it. We don't want to talk about it. In general, we can say, yeah, I'm really stressed out. Yeah, but what, what, what is it? It's a little smaller monster that's underneath there. What's causing that? Listen, the first step, as you well know, if you've been here a while, It's always the easiest step. You don't even have to do anything about it. Just name it. But I'm telling you, in the naming of it, the power of that thing kind of backs off a little bit. Step two. Step into a counselor's office and get help. Ah, come on. Yeah, I know. You don't have enough time, do you? And you don't have enough money. I'm just, I'm just, listen, this may sound like a scolding, may sound like a smart aleck. I just don't know why you want to live out the rest of your time fighting this monster. And I don't know why you want to waste your resources fighting your monster when you could settle in with a counselor in a few sessions, in a few months, get the help. Maybe you can't afford not to see a counselor. Listen, I spent a little bit of time in the counselor's office. Uh, The lovely Darlene and I went to marriage counseling for obvious reasons. She was super messed up, and the counselor and I got her her turned around. (laughs) I don't have to tell you guys that. There's moments in a counselor's office, and you're like, hey, I tried that, and I didn't like it. Okay, then get a new counselor. We had a great counselor. There's moments in the counselor's office where she or he just lets you talk. And all of a sudden you're like, bam, wow. I n- where did that come from? I never knew that. Now sometimes it's like, man, I am such a jerk. But now we can do something about it. Sometimes like, bam, you've been holding on to that for this many years? There's like, Bam. I've never said that out loud to anybody. 
it, I don't know how to help you if you have a stigma against counseling. I don't know what to do about that. But if you got a monster that's persistent and pervasive and it won't go away, and you're like, I'm just going to pray more. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm just going to try harder. You just need to sit with somebody. And if you need a recommendation, we can help you with that. Last one. Step back. And realize there, there's hope. See, some of you came in, you're cruising. If you're a graduating senior, you're like, my life is perfect. If you're a college kid that just got home from the summer, you're like, ah, everything's great. But the rest of us, we are barely making it. We don't even want to go to bed at night because we're just going to sit there and stare at the ceiling wondering what to do about our issues. We're scared to talk about it with anybody because we think we're going to get judged or put down or excluded. Listen, you were never meant to carry this all by yourself. Peter, who knew a lot about failure and mess up and monsters in the New Testament, follower of Jesus who messed up, says, you've got to cast your concerns. You've got to cast your burdens. You've got to throw it onto Jesus. It's too heavy for you to carry on your own. And you may need someone else to help you carry it for sure. That may be a friend that for sure is going to be a counselor. And Jesus says, throw it over here. Because there's hope. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to continue to live like that. There is help and there's hope. So I would encourage you, whatever you've been using to numb that, to cover that up, the monster spray that you spray into your room hoping it goes away, whatever unnecessary, ineffective things you've been using, Put that aside so you can see clearly what's going on, and then you clearly see a path of getting help. There's hope there. There's hope there. There's hope there. Because God Almighty, who sent Jesus Christ to say, listen, I understand your brokenness. I understand your struggle. And the answer and the help and the hope is in Jesus. Jesus.